Hi, I'm Arthur Breitman. Um, this is a Tezos video dev update. It's been a while since the last one, and this is the first one since the BetaNet has launched. So it's been five days, and it was a smooth launch. It's been running smoothly. So big congratulations to everyone involved and to everyone in the community for making it happen so flawlessly. I'm very, very uh, thrilled about it. One thing I've been doing is uh, going on tzscan.io and looking at delegation. Like what I'm super excited about is seeing how passionate people are with uh, delegating their stakes and seeing the whole delegated ecosystem start to take play. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I see the new delegates emerging, uh, people we didn't hear about who are, uh, who, who are coming out and becoming delegates. So that is super, uh, super exciting for me. And today, uh, I'm going to cover a few uh, different topics. So just because a beta net is launched doesn't mean that development is stopping and there's a lot coming. And I want to talk about that. So we're going to be talking about improvements to the current beta net uh, and then features that I personally would love to see uh, included in the next upgrades to the network because we have a vote, a vote coming up in, uh, in six months. And third, um, opportunities for the general ecosystem. All right, so improvements to the beta net. The first thing is hardening the network, and that means several things. That means more tests. We have the test set has grown. It, I think it's doubled over the past year, and it needs to grow a lot more. We have we need to have tests for everything, and tests give you two things. One, they let you know that everything is working as intended, and two, they let you be more creative with the code because you're more likely to be willing to do changes to the code and experiments if you have a very strong test set that tells you that everything is going fine. Formal verification is like test set on steroids. It's a way of making all the changes you want and, make, and, and, and then trying to prove that you've preserved all the properties. We're not there yet. Uh, we're building the code in a way that should make that possible. But for now, increasing the test set. Hang on, I'm speaking too fast. Let me slow down. The second thing is working on the mempool. Now, for those who don't know, in a blockchain, the mempool is a set of unconfirmed transactions which are pending, which are being gossiped about on a peer-to-peer -peer network, and which are going to be included in blocks. And the mempool is often overlooked uh, in terms of building blockchains. You know, you'll sometimes hear, oh, having smart contracts on a blockchain is harder, uh, it's, it's more complicated to build. Actually, it's, it's not really. What is more complicated with smart contracts is getting your mempool right. And so, if I, you know, if I had to say, like, what is the biggest insight that was gained building Tezos is the importance of mempool management. And we have a lot of cool ideas for that. The good part is that changing the mempool, changing the network layer, because we also need to keep working on the peer blacklisting and peer whitelisting, that's something that can be done without touching the protocol. That's not, you know, there's no hard fork, there's no fork involved whatsoever in doing that. One thing which will involve changing the protocol is integration of PVSS. Now, I've been talking about PVSS for a while now, and it's a technique for generating better uh, random numbers uh, on our blockchain. Currently, we have an economic game that miners are playing with each other um, in order to generate those random numbers. It's okay, we can do much better with PVSS. It's already uh, implemented, it's in its own branch. It wasn't merged for the, uh, for the beta net, but since then it's been uh, audited and is ready for, uh, for a merge. So I think that before the main net, uh, I'd like to see, uh, perhaps uh, through a hard fork for convenience, integration of, uh, of PVSS to guarantee that the randomness on the chain is really, really high uh, quality. Tuning gas constants, that's also something that might be part of this, uh, of this package. So we, uh, we have on the network right now really high gas constants. It's expensive to create contracts. It's expensive to run them. There are two reasons for that. One is that the vocation of Tezos is not to be running like any type of application really fast. It's really focused on um, having smarter ways of making transactions. But the other one is that it's always easier to have a high gas cost and then bring it down than the opposites. You don't want to be in a situation where, you know, someone is relying on a certain uh, price for gas to run a contract and all of a sudden they can't run the contract anymore because the gas is so much more expensive. So we want to bring it, uh, bring it down. And finally, there's a Baker demon. So the Baker demon, he talks to a node, he grabs a bunch of transactions from the mempool and forms a block with it. And right now it's doing it in a way which is okay. 
uh, it sort it it, it assumes um, a, a linear price uh, of of uh, of transaction with respect to size and with respect to gas, and it sorts a transaction so that if you pay more, you're more likely to be included. So that's uh, similar in every uh, in every blockchain. What I'd like to see is to solve a, a better optimization problem. It's a double uh, commodity knapsack that you have to solve for doing this. It's a little trickier because uh, one property that you have is that not every subset of a valid subset of transaction is itself a valid subset and ordering matters. And this is because transactions can depend on each other. Now, very interestingly, in Bitcoin, if you look at a set of transactions and if you look at their UTXOs, you have a very simplified model of commutativity, right? You can look at a bunch of transactions and know very, very quickly whether or not they conflict or whether or not there are dependencies without having to parse you know, all the internals of the transaction. Uh, in a model, in an account-based model, the amount that um, uh, with smart contracts, you cannot do this uh, as easily. The reason is that because this account model gives you more commutativity, you actually, your transactions are more compatible with each other than they would be with UTXOs. With a UTXO, you'd modify a smart contract, then you have a new version of it, and no one would be able to submit a transaction to it. They would have to refer to that new version. So basically, you're not, you know, you're not decreasing functionality, you're increasing functionality, you're making it uh, easier for people to, uh, to interact with the blockchain at the same time. On the other hand, you're losing the ability to have a very simple, very fast to check model for commutativity. And so you have to be more careful in your mempool management. I would say, if, you know, if there's one downside of this smart contract model, uh, that would be it. Now, there are ways to deal with that. Uh, one of the interesting ways that uh, we've been thinking about is uh, to try and have a different transaction model for the transactions that initiate smart contracts versus the one that come from smart contracts directly. And in some sense, you would restrict uh, commutativity a little bit, but in a way that doesn't impair normal use, but gain a lot of ability to um, uh, to test if uh, if a set is consistent uh, with itself, so that's interesting work on the Baker Demon. And again, that does not that's just a change in uh, that's just a Docker push. It does not change uh, the protocol itself. Moving on, new features. So now I'm talking about features that could come in future versions of the protocol through proper protocol upgrades. And before I start talking about that, I'd like to. Uh, answer a question I get asked very often, which is like, oh, when, when is there going to be a roadmap? You know, when is the Tezos Foundation going to put a roadmap? Or when are you, where are you going to put a roadmap? And this is a decentralized project. The entire point of Tezos is that there should not be a central entity that sets out a roadmap. It, I point you to the position paper of Tezos, which explained that. So what I'm going to be talking about is what I'm personally I'm interested in. But if you have different goals for Tezos, if you have different ideas for things you want to implement in the protocol, by all means, pursue those, right? I, you know, what I'm going to talk about is I think that makes sense. There are people who might want different approaches. For example, I'd like to see shielded transactions uh, in Tezos for privacy. And I think the best way to do that is to use the same technology that Zcash has been using. Now, some people might say, actually, no, we, we, we should um, use confidential transactions instead because you know, we won't have all this uh, snark setup. But you know, I, I, I think the trade-offs make favor snark heavily. So I like, to, uh, I like to start developing shielded transactions in parallel. And also, I would like to improve the proof of stake algorithm of Tezos. So there are several parts when you think about proof of stake. One is, Who's taking part? Defining who's taking part of the consensus. So, is it every coin holder? Is it everyone who puts up a bond? Is it someone who has had a uh, you know a token for a long time? That's the first question you need to answer. And then the second question is, how do you do consensus on top of that? And those things can be fairly separate. So, um, in Tezos, the proof of stake version of Tezos tries to follow as much as possible direct coin ownership. It's not. Uh, there are other models where you put up a large bond and you become a validator because you have this very large bond, so you prove that you have a stake, but it's not proportional to stake ownership. And in the design of Tezos, it tries really hard to keep that proportionality. And I think that's an important aspect of Tezos. 
and the model with delegation that requires delegation to still have some skin in the game, I think that's a solid model that's here to stay. So that's a baking model. The actual consensus algorithm, well, first of all, it will be improved with the uh, uh, introduction of PVSS, but on top of that, I think we can do a little better. I think it's very, very close to um, a lot of uh, algorithms that have come out of academia and which have proven properties, but so far the properties of the Tezos consensus algorithm, they've been proven only with simulations and, um, uh, and tests. We can do better than that, so I'd like to formalize the proof of stake algorithm because formalizing it, once we know exactly um, what the limits are, it's also a way to make it more scalable, it's also a way to make it faster once we have very, very clear bounds on what matters. So that's something that I will discuss uh, more in an upcoming video. Okay, finally, some uh, ecosystem opportunities. So there's a few folks in Paris working on an Android app and an iOS app. Uh, and what I'm excited about is there's three different elliptic curves uh, used in, uh, in Tezos, and that might seem overkill. So we started out with simply ED5519, because that's just a good curve to choose. Uh, but then some people said, well, there's a lot of hardware that is Bitcoin specific that requires the Bitcoin curve, SecP256K1, and so SecP256 K1 was introduced um, as an alternative, and then finally uh, went all the way with P256. So now P256 is not really used in cryptocurrencies, and but it's actually the most standard NFT curve there is out there. It's the one standardized by NIST. Now there's some theories that says, well, it's a dangerous curve because it has random coefficients, but we don't know where they came from. I mean, it'd be maybe you know maybe the NSA picks the coefficients. Now that said. There is no known way of picking coefficients that make a curve weak. So for all intended and purposes, given a, given a threat model, we feel, and a lot of cryptographers feel the same way, is that P256 is fine to use. Now, the benefit of that is hardware support. So um, iPhones have uh, secure enclaves that can do signatures using P256. Uh, computers have TPM 2.0, which can do signatures like this. So what we're looking for is building wallets which are able to tap in the hardware capabilities of their devices to give you the equivalent of a hardware wallet, but on an everyday device. And I think that's really, really exciting. Now you might, you know, some of you who are familiar with this might say like, hey, hang on a second, you can generate a key on those services, but you can't, you know, you, you, but you can't export it. And that's where smart contracts come to the rescue because you can have um, one of two uh, multi-sig contracts so that you can rekey if you lose your phone or if you lose your laptop. So there's a lot of solutions and a lot of ways of integrating smart contracts inside wallet apps that I think will make for some uh, uh, solid uh, user experience. That's all for uh, this time. I'll uh, be there back in a few weeks. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm super excited for the Benedict launch. Please uh, try out and build stuff on the network and let us know what you're doing.